Are we good, Abel? Check. Check, check. Mike, check. One, we're um, just about getting ready to get started. Um, as you can tell from the uh, header slide, we're going to take a little bit of a deviation from the book of Revelation and look at a very, very interesting passage in the Bible um, that, need, that needs to be taught before we get into the heart of our study in the book of Revelation between chapters 6 and 19. Um, and this is often referred to as the 70 weeks of Daniel. Um, this, is gonna, th this passage that we're going to cover tonight is extremely foundational in and, and really in setting the stage for um, what we're, what we're going to be covering over the next several weeks and months. Um, if you want to go ahead and take your how to study the Bible booklets. Uh, we're going to be looking at a chart on page number 20. Um, we're going to be unpacking this little chart. Uh, it looks a little bit complicated, perhaps, but it really isn't. Uh, we're going to just uh, look at four verses, verses 24 through 27, and unpack each one of those verses um, so that we can see... Um, and, and like I said, really set the stage and lay, lay a really solid foundation for what we're going to be getting into in um, chapters 6 through 19 as we start looking at the heart of our study um, in the book of Revelation. It's really, really important that we, that we grasp um, these 70 weeks. Um, this is a, a very, very significant passage in the Bible, um, and um, perhaps one of the most profound passages in the Word of God, uh, especially when it comes to the prophetic implications that you find in Scripture. Let's have a word of prayer. Um, just do a quick little uh, update to let everybody know where we're at, and we will um, dive right into this amazing, uh, this amazing passage of the text that we're going to be looking at. Father, we come before you this evening, Lord, we're grateful Lord, for all that um, you have been revealing us, revealing to me personally, Lord Jesus, in this amazing book um, known as the book of Revelation, the revelation of you, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that as we press on and we look at all the events that, um, that are beginning to play out right before our eyes, Lord, we still look for the imminent return of you for your bride, the church, the body of Christ. And Lord, we can't wait for that day. But until that day comes, Lord, we will continue as we have been focusing on Sunday mornings to prepare, to continue on, Lord God, to just uh, staying true to our purpose, to our mission, to see the lost saved and the saved disciple, Lord, growing in the grace and the knowledge of your precious son. And I, I pray, Lord, that tonight your spirit would reveal to us, would uh, make known to us, Lord God, the significance of this very, very important passage in your word. Um, as we, um, as we look to you, Lord God, to, uh, to be the revealer, to allow your spirit to just guide us and to teach us. Lord, we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, Gilbert, can you do me a favor and close that door, please? In the, the hallway door. Thank you. So if you guys remember from last week, we kind of kicked off, um, or we were looking at chapter number five in the book of Revelation. Uh, which was an interesting part of our study. Um, we, had, we were looking at what we have been referring to as heavenly events. Um, so taking your Bible, Larry, go ahead and put the, the, the revelation chart up, or it's okay, it's going to come up now. Um, you're all familiar with this chart by now, and it's a very, very important one. So we just concluded last week with the events and again, I want to remind each and every one of you that when we're studying or when we're looking at the book of Revelation, a lot of the focus are the events that are going to play out and are already playing out even prophetically. Um, 
we went through, as you all know, as we've considered the significance of the structure of this book. It's divided into three parts uh, based on two significant events um, where heaven opens. Revelation 4.1, the rapture. Um, Revelation 19.11, the second coming of Christ. Um, so as we were unpacking and looking at those um, first um, four or five chapters in the book of Revelation, last week we took the time to focus on a very, very unique passage, um, and we looked at what we refer to as the seven-sealed book revealed, and there's a book that is revealed to us in chapter number five, and um, it's got seven seals on it, and we're going to be unpacking those seals starting next week, um, but last week, if you remember from that study, the Bible is not explicit in terms of what that book is specifically. Um, a lot of people have referred to it as the Bible, but the Bible is an open book, man. God has revealed to us so much about his plan and his purpose. So um, this particular book was a book that nobody except the Lord Jesus Christ himself was able to reveal. And we also mentioned the fact that it might be the book of Daniel. Isn't it interesting that we're looking at the book of Daniel? A lot of theologians have implied or assumed that it perhaps might be the book of Daniel because the uh, 12th chapter of the book of Daniel reveals to us that, um, yeah, that that book would be kept secret until the end times. As you'll see tonight, uh, there's, because of some things that have transpired historically, um, uh, we are going to see how it's not the book of Daniel because God has revealed to so much to us. So if you guys remember from our time together last week, I shared with you a, what I thought was a personal thought about what that book might be. Does anybody remember what that was? Anybody have a thought or an opinion or a, a memory about what the book might be? The little book or the book that is mentioned in chapter number five. And this, we're still, remember this, the red box, the seven seals book revealed? You want to look at your notes from last week? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Pastor Mike. My question was, what is the little book that we referenced last week? And Pastor Mike just let everybody know we refer to it as the title deed of planet Earth, right? Right now, Jesus is, owns the title deed. He's the deed holder, I believe. And um, we've got a squatter that has taken control of this planet uh, since Genesis chapter number three and the book of Revelation is going to make everything right. Did anybody watch um, the news here recently, just in the last couple days? Actually, it was a significant speech that um, our president made last week in front of the UN. Anybody track that at all? What was the, uh, what was the scope of that, that, um, that speech? Anybody remember or anybody look at the news or watch the news a little bit? Because it proves exactly what it is that we're considering when we look at this book when we look at the book of Revelation and all that's transpiring and all that's being revealed and unveiled before us. His agenda in that meeting or in that speech, I know a lot of you guys don't really follow the dude. I don't either, but it just pops up. Tell me again. Yeah, I was part of it. That was part of the discussion, but the, the main part of his speech had to do with the dividing of the land Right, the land of Israel, creating this Palestinian state that the globalist agenda and the one worlders are definitely pushing hard, him, him being a part of that whole agenda. That being said, it just proves again everything that we have been talking about and referring to. And if you remember from our time together last week, what did the, what did the Lord refer to the land as in our study in our time together last week? That it's whose? Who does it belong to? It belongs to him. It's his land. It's his planet. It's his creation. We know that there's a squatter in place right now. We know him in, out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, is the God of this world, and he's the one that will do anything and everything to disrupt and, and, and cause confusion and chaos in your personal lives, but he's also doing it 
from a planetary perspective, even from an earthly, from a, from a, um, a cosmo perspective, if you look at places like uh, Revelation chapter number 11. I'm sorry, Daniel chapter number 11. So that being said, I just want to, again, just set the stage and, and remind you that it is going to be a battle for that land of promise that God made to, uh, to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter number 12. So keeping that in mind, I want you to be mindful and aware of what the Word of God is going to reveal to us out of this very, very interesting passage that we're referring to as the 70 weeks of Daniel. Um, very, very key passage. You get this passage down, you won't have any confusion about any of the eschatological or any of the prophetic things that are taught us, taught to us in the Word of God. This will ish, this will deal with the issue of a pre-trib versus mid-trib versus versus a post-trib rapture. It'll deal with the issue of uh, of. Uh, replacement theology and all these Christian or all these Christendom religions that want to replace Israel and God's plan. It's dealt with in this passage as you will see here tonight. So get these four verses down, Pat, and you're going to be okay. So that being said, keep page 20 handy in your little booklet. Does everybody have a copy of the booklet with them? I hope you do uh, because if you grasp this chart and how it lays out, um, you will be able to um, defend um, um, what this church believes about the rapture, what this church believes about the second coming, what this church believes about the body of Christ versus Israel, two very, very distinct entities in God's plan. That's principle number two. Keep page number three handy as well because we're going to refer to the principles continually. Uh, you guys know from principle number two, that the Word of God, and this helps you rightly divide the Bible, um, you need to understand that the Bible is written to t- three very distinct groups of people, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. Um, what, where we're going to be camping out tonight as we unpack Daniel chapter uh, 9, verses 24 through 27, um, God is explicitly referring to the nation of Israel. I've shared with you a number of times that the book of Daniel is the Old Testament Jewish perspective of the end times. It's the left part of the bookmark where the book of Revelation is revealed and given to you and to me, to the church, so we understand God's plan in the last days. So those are the bookend books. Daniel and Revelation, man, they go hand in glove. So I would encourage you to to get... Uh, reading and get studying in both. The book of Daniel has an interesting structure to it. You guys already know. The, there's 12 chapters. What does the number 12 represent in the, book, in the Bible? I'm sorry? The number of Israel. It's Israel's number, right? There's 12 tribes. There's Genesis chapter 12. You see um, God creating the nation through Abraham. Exodus chapter 12 is where he liberates them from Egypt. It's, it's in Acts chapter 12 where he pretty much washes his hands of their uh, rejection of the kingdom. And you just see God doing some amazing things throughout the word of God as it relates to that particular number. So there's 12 chapters. They divide perfectly in half. The first six chapters are historical. They just kind of give you and me an account of some of the things that are going on in Daniel's life as he's held captive uh, both in Babylon and then later on in Persia. And then when you get to chapter 7 through the rest of the chapter, everything is prophetic. And uh, man, some weird and crazy things in the book of Daniel. A, a, A book that has been debated to this day about its authenticity, about whether or not um, it's just all allegorical or whether we should be taking it literal. And those of you that know the, my personal position and the position of this church, every book, chapter, verse, from a biblical interpretation perspective, we take literal. So we believe in a literal rapture. We believe in a literal second coming. We believe in a literal kingdom come. All those things that are allegorical, which is basically symbolic is something that we don't buy into in this church. A lot of people will try to take a lot of the stuff that is found in the book of Revelation as symbolic. The Bible will always reveal to you when it's symbolic. Um, But if it doesn't, um, take it to heart. 
take it literally. And God will shed so much light in terms of how he works. So this chart is key. We have been hanging out in that little red box, what we refer to as the heavenly events, some of the events that are going to be playing out immediately after the rapture of the church. We talked about um, the judgment seat of Christ. Was it last week or a couple? No, it was a couple weeks ago or a couple sessions ago, right? And then last week we looked at the little book. Do you remember how, um, how uh, chapter 6 begins? This is a really interesting verse as we brought our time together to a close last week. This is an interesting verse found uh, in our text immediately after the unveiling as, as Jesus begins to break these seals and reveal to us um, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and all these other things that we're going to be covering in the sixth chapter, you find a really interesting thought or a really interesting verse uh, in chapter number six. Again, look at with me up at this chart. Chapters 6 through 19 are key. This is where we're going to cover the heart of our study, what we're referring to as the tribulation period. Are you with me? You need to understand. You need to understand, too, that the tribulation period is divided into two halves. The first half I'm referring to is the false kingdom of the Antichrist. And then Jesus refers, this, these are his words, his terms, in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 21, the great tribulation. This is where we're going to look at the seals, the trumpets, the vials, uh, the three woes, um, all these crazy things that we often hear about in the book of Revelation. Those are going to be covered in this part of our study. That being said, the tribulation period, as you'll see tonight, is seven years uh, covered explicitly in these chapters right here, 6 through 19. So look at how chapter 6 begins after this sealed book and the seals began to be broken. And I saw, look at verse one, and I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of trumpets, one of the four beasts, I'm not sure which one, but one of the four beasts saying, come and see, come and see. And what I, what I want you to understand is at this point, you and I are invited to look over the banisters of heaven and observe all that's going to play out in the book of Revelation. We're going to see who these four horsemen of the apocalypse are. We're going to learn about those. Those have already been revealed to us. But to actually see the literal events play out is something that we will obviously be witnessing. To what extent are you going to share? I'm going to share with you some thoughts about the order and the structure of the book of Revelation uh, next week, so you, you want to be here for that because there's these misconceptions about its structure. I'm going to share with you some interesting things about the book and how it's ordered for you and for me that uh, you may not be mindful of or be aware of. So uh, this is where we find ourselves, and now we're right, diving right into chapter number six. And before we do that, it's important that we look at and provide you a Jewish perspective of what we're referring to as the tribulation period. And that's where we're going to camp out tonight. Hence the, um, the uh, 70 weeks of Daniel. All right? Um, another thought I want to share with you real quick. Um, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. And this is... Principle number four of Bible study, if you want to go ahead and turn there. And print page number three, uh, there's three applications to Scripture. There's, there's a historical account, and there's a prophetic account to the Word of God. It says this, remember, Isaiah says, or the Lord speaking to Isaiah, remember the former things of old, for I am God, the Lord says, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the what? The end from the beginning and from the ancient of things that are not yet, not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So when God looks down at his timelines and all the things that we're going to be talking about, he just sees one major significant event, right? Larry, could you bring up the uh, dispensational chart real quick? This is a key perspective that I don't ever want you to lose sight of, ever, ever to lose sight of, because this is the big picture. Knowing and realizing that God has moved throughout history. And this is principle number three of your principles of Bible study. The principle of time. And there's two types of 
two chron- uh, there's two uh, timelines that we provide you, and they're found on pages uh, 11 and 12. The first one is a chronological time, a chronological timeline. Second Peter chapter three verse eight, where Peter says that a day, one day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. That's a huge revelation because all you have to do is go back and study um, the history of, of, of when God created the first humans, which is right around 4,000 BC, 4,004 BC. So from Adam and Eve to the end of the Old Testament is 4,000 years. From Jesus to where we're at today is 6,000 years. And then what did Jesus do or what did the Lord do on the seventh day? He rested. That's the millennium. That's that seventh day. Right? And then we also have this perspective that we've been sharing with you. This is the big picture. So if you follow closely and if you look at that green line, that green line is key in understanding what we're going to be talking about tonight. Knowing and realizing that God treats the nation of Israel different than he does the church. It's critical that you understand that. So what you're going to see is some prophecy is a prophecy that's playing out right around here historically. And we know because of their rejection of Jesus and the crucifixion that Israel ends up where? Dispersed. And what we know historically is the diaspora, right? For how long? Almost 2,000 years. We know about the Balfour Declaration in 1917 when, he got the, when God prepared the land. That's revealed to us in Ezekiel chapter 36. In chapter 37... He gathers the people, the valley of dry bones, the nation of Israel. He gathered them from where? The four corners of the earth. How did that happen? They got their independence. They started coming home. And what was one of the huge events historically that caused them or forced them to start going back to the land? Right? The Holocaust. The Holocaust. And here we find ourselves, chapter 37. What's the next event in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38? Hmm? The battle of what? Has that happened yet? No, but it's about to happen. Right? Don't let CNN and Fox and all these other knuckleheads, PBS and all these other uh, news rags deceive you to think and believe that Ukrainians, the Ukraine's winning this war. They're not. Because it's Russia that shows up in the, in the Bible prophetically. Not the West. Is the West going to have a role? NATO? Um, the West as we know it, of course. That's going to be the new world order, the globalist agenda. We're seeing it play out right before our eyes, which is so incredible and so unbelievable. So, the Lord drives this truth home, man. That I'm just gonna, this timeline is nothing more than my plan to redeem a fallen creation, a fallen <coughs> planet, and broken and fallen lives. That's what this whole thing is about. So praise the Lord for his plan and how he's revealed it to us in his word. So tonight we're gonna get a Old Testament Jewish perspective of the end times where the book of Revelation, which is what we're going to really be focusing on in the coming weeks and months, is a New Testament church age perspective. Jesus himself made reference to the book of Daniel in his life. In the most significant passage in the life of Jesus um, which is known, and, and we remember this from our study a few months back. I think we started last fall. We referred to it as the signs of the time study. Our theme, if you remember, was Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. It's in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 21, where you see Jesus making a reference to the what? To the book of Daniel and the abomination of desolation. That's a key event prophetically. The abomination of desolation is going to happen as you look at your revelation chart. Larry, could you put the revelation chart up again, please? Um, As you look at the revelation chart and you bring that thing up, it's going to happen right here. Bear with me because when we get to 2 Thessalonians chapters numbers 1 and 2 on Sunday mornings, we're going to cover some of this stuff. 
And it's all going to make sense and we're going to connect some dots for you as we use Thessalonians and Revelation to shed more light on what's happening from an end times perspective. So that'll be a key event. It'll happen right here. And we're going to talk about how he's going to be ultimately revealed. And Jesus refers to this Daniel, the book of Revelation. Go ahead and turn with me to, to Matthew 24 real quick. I want you guys to see the passage with me. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to share with you a, a, few, a few verses from the text just to give you a, uh, a context. Look at verse 1 in Matthew 24. It says, And Jesus, he went out and he parted from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. It says in verse 2, and these are red letters in your Bible, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And there's this temple structure will be destroyed. You're going to hear it in Daniel's prophecy tonight. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, there's your context, right? Those of you that have been to Israel with me, you have already been able, you, we sat in what is suggested is the traditional location of where Jesus was as he looked over the Kidron Valley into the Temple Mount as he's revealing these truths to these, uh, to these four disciples. I say four disciples because in Mark chapter 13, it mentions three guys uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. The disciples came out of him privately saying, tell us, when shall all these things be? And this is an interesting question that they ask, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? There's your context, right? The return of Christ, and what? And of the end of the world. So the world as we know it, folks, whether you like it or not, or know it or not, is going to come to an end. And Jesus begins to go, he goes through this amazing dissertation um, revealing to these guys of some of the things to expect. And the Jesus answered and said, on them, look at the first thing that he mentions. He warns them about false teachings at the end times. Number one, first thing he lists. Whenever you see lists in the Bible, God's re driving home and revealing to us that beware that in the last days there's going to be a lot of lying going on, man. I'll tell you what, the internet has been one of the most powerful tools to bring about deception. You wouldn't believe the questions and the links that people send me about all this stuff, man. It's crazy town out there. Look at verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Tell me that's not happening, right? Um, see, I mean, isn't, inter isn't Africa right now an interesting place? Huh? Some 12 nations right now are starting to wave the Russian flag and leaning towards the BRIC nations. and um, Yeah, France and the U.S. and the Western countries, NATO, are not backing down. Why is that? Anybody have any idea? Anybody have any notions as to why they're pushing back significantly? Anybody have any thoughts about the fundamental reason as to why things are going awry? Obviously, the African nations are kind of sick and tired of being pillaged all these years by these colonial powers, right? Right? While taking their minerals, their oil, their gas, diamonds. diamonds. Why are they embracing Russians? What is the issue, you think? One thing, and it's going to happen to us. It's going to affect us. Currency. Currency. Right? Yeah. So if we can move the U.S. out, guess what? We're going to embrace a, it might be the Chinese currency, it might be the ruble, who knows? But there's a pushback to what will become a one world currency. I think we know from the Bible whose currency is ultimately going to win out. But until that happens, you're seeing this happening, wars and rumors of wars. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. Who would have thought, huh? 120 years it's been since Morocco experienced an earthquake and Diego had just happened to be there. Um, I'm not laughing at what Diego experienced, but you know, it's crazy. Earthquakes in diverse places, in different places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. This is an interesting verse. 
Then shall they deliver unto you to be afflicted and killed, and ye shall be hated of all the nations for my name's sake. Uh, can you back up to verse number, um, I believe it's verse number eight again, Larry. Uh, I don't want you to lose sight of this one verse. I don't know if, I think it was verse seven. Um, look at verse um, Oh, yeah, verse 8, are these things the beginning of sorrows? Um, hold on. Oh, verse 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the what? But the end is not yet. What's the implication? I think I touched on that phrase in our time together in this study back several months ago, um, that we would get to see the convergence of some of these signs, right? But the end is not yet. Here's what I want you to understand. This is going to be driven home tonight. You're not going to be here to see all the stuff that's going to happen at the end of the world. Praise God. Why? The rapture of the church. The body of Christ. Are we getting to see? Are we going to be able to, are we not be able? I don't want any ability as far as this is concerned, but are we going to witness and see and probably experience some persecution Absolutely. I think we already are. Look what's happening in Pakistan and in India with, with believers and with Christians and in China. And think about this country and this secular shift culturally and, and those of us that don't agree with what's going on culturally, we're looking, we're being looked at as being what? Old school, traditionalists, whatever. It's crazy where we are at. So, Jesus drives us home. Let's keep reading here in Matthew chapter 24. Look down with me in verse, I think we were in verse number 11, were we not? Um, look at verse 11. Many false prophets shall come, shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We've already talked about this passage. Who's he writing to? To the church? Who said the church? To Israel, right? Larry, put up the chart again, the, 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 the revelation chart. I want you guys to see this. You need to get this. There's a little section in this chart that you need to understand. It's this one right here. How do you get saved? The means of salvation in these three different periods, right? How do you get saved in the church age? This is the church age, the last 2,000 years. How do you get saved in the church age? Through grace. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And Paul says what in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. And now shall be. Ah, he didn't tell you to endure to the end. Who should be enduring through the end? The people that are going to be around in the tribulation period. Jews and Gentiles. I was talking to somebody just yesterday. He says, wow, what do you think I should say to some of my family members that will probably be left behind. A couple things. Find a nice lot somewhere in Pecos and go, deal, go, go build a bunker, perhaps. Or pack up your stuff, move to Israel, and become a Jew. Full-blown Jew. Don't take the mark and endure to the end. That's who Jesus is writing to here in Matthew chapter 24. And thou shall be saved, he says, in verse 13, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, right? Is that our gospel? Whose gospel is it? Come on, somebody speak up. Did you know there's two gospels in the Bible? There's the gospel of grace revealed to us in 1 Corinthians 15. Larry, could you put 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 up real quick? You need to get this. I'm not going to back. You guys, we need to embrace and understand how the Bible rightly divides. If not, you're going you're gonna to put the church in the trib and the, tri and the church preaching this gospel versus that gospel. You know who preaches the gospel of the kingdom? The Catholic church and all these other Protestant faiths out there. You know, we call that post-millennialism. The church will usher in the kingdom. You know who's going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom? Anybody have any idea? We're going to learn about them in Revelation chapter 7 and in Revelation 14. 
You know who those are? There's going to be a massive revival on this planet. It's 144,000. Here's our gospel. Paul, writing to a church, just like a sent Bible church. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. What's the word gospel mean? Good news. The gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and, which, and wherein ye stand. He says in verse 2, by which also ye are what? Saved. What is it that saves you? If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There's the gospel in the church age, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That his death, his shed blood saves us, and then his resurrection and what gives us eternal life. These guys show up right here in... We just read it here in verse number um, 14. number fourteen, and guess what they're preaching? The Messiah is coming. The kingdom is coming. That's the gospel of the kingdom. That's what they're preaching. There is no more death, burial, and resurrection. Right? Anybody see the movie Left Behind? Right? Anybody see there's there's this cheesy one that we watched. It was on it was on Prime. T- Larry saw it years ago when she was. In high school, she said it was called um, Thief. Was it Thief? Yeah, Thief in the Night. Do you remember that movie when they used to play it? 12, 16, is it 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter film? With the old projectors. And it would always break halfway through. It had that same cheesy feeling or whatever. You know what I saw in, those, in these movies? That people are going to receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior. No, they're not. The Bible just told you how you're going to get saved in the tribulation period. Endure to the end and don't, res- and don't take the mark. Yes, Sonia? So when you say people who are left here pack up and move to Israel, like, is that going to be a safety? No, not at all. If anything, you're going to die. Yeah. Just don't take the mark. Then, well, how do we know you're going to die? Let's keep reading. Should we keep reading? Yeah, Check this out. Talking. Watch this. You're not going to be safe. Some folks will be safe. Yeah, wait till we get there and there's a place on the Jordanian side of the border known as Bozra. You know what the word Bozra means? The Hebrew word for Bozra, sheepfold. And who's the good shepherd? Jesus. He's going to be protecting some people. Check this out. Um, Where are we? 13, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come, right? How many times have we been? I've been to, seriously, to missions conferences where a preacher got up and preached this verse out of context and says, this is why we need to go out and reach the world so that the rapture could happen. That's not the context. Principle number one of Bible study is context, context, context. You need to keep reading and get the context. Look at the rest of the passage. Look at verse number 15. And when ye therefore shall see the uh, what? The abomination of desolation. Spoken by who? By Daniel. Nowhere in the book of Daniel do you see any, any mention of the church. None. Zero. Why? Why? She's a mystery. She's hidden. It's a Jewish view. It's a Jewish world view of the end times. Look at the next part of the verse. Spoken by Daniel the prophet. Isn't it interesting that Jesus refers to Daniel as a prophet? That's so cool. Because a lot of theologians discount it as a prophecy. Standing in the holy place, and he will do that. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Man, the scriptures, the word of God is driving home the importance of of us understanding this truth. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Tezuki, New Mexico, flee into the mountains. Those that are where? Are you with me now, Sonia? Why I'm saying, go there. Pack your bags. It's going to be a crazy time, man. Let's not take it for granted. Let's not take the gospel of grace 
this very unique dispensation that we know as the church age where grace still prevails to share the gospel, the good news with people that need to receive him as personal savior because that's what's going to... And again, you're not, you're not doing this for a, as a rescue plan, but you will be rescued. Look at the next verse. Verse 17, let him which is in the housetops not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back into the in to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Remember the phrase those days? Hmm? Do you remember that phrase? Yeah. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither be on the Sabbath day. That should tell you a lot, right? Who it's written to, right? Sabbath day is for who? Israel. Verse 21. And then shall be what? These are not my words. These are Jesus' words. Great tribulation. For such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, nor ever shall be. In other words, Jesus really drives it home in verse 21 that this planet has never seen a period that we're, this world's going to see during the tribulation period. Those seven years are going to be literally hell on earth. That's the reality of what the word of God is revealing to us. Verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the whose sake? I wonder who that is. Israel. Except for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there be, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible that they shall deceive the very elect. It's going to be a crazy time, the tribulation period. So Jesus makes mention of Daniel and this prophecy, and this is why it's important, it's imperative that we understand Daniel chapter 9, verses 24, uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses um, 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 20, what did I say, 24 through 27, right? So go ahead and turn there. We're going to start unpacking some of these verses Daniel chapter 9, I just shared with you how the book of Daniel is structured. The first six chapters are historical. The last six are prophetic. Uh, Chapter 9 has a unique structure to it as well. I love this this chapter. It's a very deep, not only chapter, again, it's the last four verses that we're going to unpack tonight, but I want you to understand tonight how it is that God even works in your life and in my life, (laughs) that if we would simply go to him, with a, with a humble and, and genuine and, and austere heart that he will reveal to us tremendous things, incredible things. That was Paul's prayer for the Colossians. Remember that? In Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 9. You know, there's three significant prayers that you find in associated with this number 9. In Ezra chapter 9, Ezra prayed for revelation and God gave him revelation. In Nehemiah chapter 9, Nehemiah does the same thing. He's praying to to God for God reveal to me what you would have me to do as it relates to the walled city of Jerusalem and God gives him an answer. And here in Daniel chapter 9, the same thing happens. Look with me here in Daniel 9. Let's start reading real quick, just in verse one. I may just kind of pick and choose some verses because it's a fairly long chapter. Obviously, it's 27 verses long. Um, But the first several verses from chapter one uh, to verse number 19, you find what I'm referring to as Daniel's prayer for revelation for his people, for the nation of Israel. Look at verse one. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet and that he would accomplish 70 years. Mark that number down because this was the prophecy of them being 
taken captive into Babylon for 70 years. That number is going to come up here in a minute. In the, in, the desolation of, in the desolations of Jerusalem, Jerusalem being destroyed in 606 BC, the Jews being led captive for 70 years into Babylon. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord, my God, and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments. We, he says, Israel, right? No church in the Old Testament. There's no Christians coming to Christ in the book of Daniel. This is all a Jewish dispensation, a Jewish period. He says, we have sinned and we have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from the precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets which spake in the name of our kings and princes and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteous, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. There's your context. And to what? And to all Israel. Are you with me? He's praying for Israel, for the Jews, Old Testament, Right around 606 BC. That thou hast driven them because of their trespasses, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faith to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. He says, man, Lord, I see our condition, man. If there's ever a prayer that we ought to be praying for this country, right? This is principle number three of Principle number four of Bible study, the three applications of scripture, the devotional application. Here's some principles, right? Instead of going to YouTube to figure out and get your revelation from all these knuckleheads online, how about just going to the Lord? How about just going to his word for revelation? He's praying and he's begging God, reveal to me on how am I to respond in leading my people that finds itself captive. And then there's an answer that plays out. Look with me down in verse number 20. Guess who shows up? Look at verse 20. And while I was yet speaking and praying and watching YouTube and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, are you, see, are you getting the context? Are you see who he's dealing with? See who he's praying for. For who? For Israel. And presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man, wow, look who shows up. Gabriel. Two archangels. We talked about this, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Only two archangels ever I know there's more, but the, only, the Bible only mentions two of them, Gabriel and Michael. Now, anytime Gabriel shows up anywhere in Scripture, you know what the context always is? The coming of the Lord. No, Israel, Michael has to do with Israel. He's the defender. He's the protector of Israel. You see that in, of all places, Daniel chapter 12 and in, in the book of Jude. But whenever Gabriel shows up, guess what God's preparing his people for? The kingdom. The king, the return of the king. When did Gabriel show up in the New Testament? In Luke what? Remember that? Come on. Remember when we went to Nazareth together and we went to that church up on top of the hill? The church of the what? The Annunciation, they call it. Catholic church, mind you. But that's where they traditionally say that Mary had this experience with the angel Gabriel and heard from him. Anytime Gabriel shows up, he's preparing God's people for the coming Messiah. And you need to understand that term Messiah, by the way, because it's a term that is only found in the book of Daniel. And what's really interesting, it's only found in the verses that we're going to look at tonight in the book of Daniel. 
I know a lot of you often refer to Jesus as your Messiah. Messiah is a Jewish term for deliverance of not just a spiritual condition, but also a political and a literal one. He's messianic in that sense. Wait till we get to Revelation chapter number 11 when we start talking about the temple and the rebuilding of the temple and how some of the Jews are expecting. I'm talking rabbis today that are expecting the Messiah to return, this deliverer that's going to deliver them from all this crazy one world government and religion that they see playing out in their, in their lives today. You know what Jesus is to me personally? My Lord and Savior. That's what he is. Why? Why are those terms different? Because of his role dispensationally. He is coming back someday at the second coming of Christ as the Messiah, as the deliverer. You're going to see that in the text. You're going to see it in the very last verse, verse 27 of Daniel chapter number 9. Man, we need to understand that this passage is so significant. Where, where did I leave off? Verse 21, yeah, I was speaking in prayer and the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision of the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, he touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Man, I'm not even going to go there, but that's an interesting concept because there was no temple at this point. He's in captivity. Verse 22, and he informed me and he talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Isn't that cool? At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandments came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the issue. You know, there's only two guys that were explicitly referred to as the beloved. One of them is right here. Daniel. Anybody know who the other guy was? John. Well, who wrote Revelation? Isn't that cool? See how God works? And God views you as the beloved if you seek revelation. You are his beloved. I'm not going to deny that, right? We don't have to split hairs here, but we know that the Shulamite woman out of the Song of Solomon, she refers to Jesus as the beloved or his, her beloved. But only two men in the Bible are given that very significant title of my beloved. Daniel and John a prophecy to the Jews, and a prophecy to the church. Isn't that cool how he just, he's consistent in anything and everything that he does. For I am come to show you, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. And that's Gabriel's conversation with him and then he's going to dive right into verse 24 and provide this amazing this amazing truth so real quick like do this for me please first put up the outline this is how we're going to unpack these four verses in Daniel chapter number nine we're going to look first at the context of God's and I'm referring and using the term calendar because we know from life generally that calendars are a way that we're able to what? To track time, right? So we're going to look at what these 70 weeks mean. Look at verse 24 again. How does the verse begin? With 70 weeks. What does that mean? We're going to define the context of that. That's why our first principle is the context of God's calendar. We need to understand what it is that Gabriel is revealing to Daniel in this passage. And then we're going to look at the countdown of God's calendar. This is a really fascinating, um, extremely incredible section, not just these two verses, but also all of history and what God and how it is that God counts Right? We know in our own calendar, in our, in our Gregorian calendar, that every four years when we have a leap year, there's certain days that we count, the 29th of February, and there's other times in these off leap year years where we don't count certain days. I'm going to show you how God counts. 
and how he keeps track of time. It's revealed to us in scripture. And then we'll bring the whole thing to a close with verse number 27 as we um, just share some thoughts of how he just brings it all to a head. So are you with me? Does everybody have page 20 in their hands? This is going to be really an important little, little chart to consider um, as we start to unpack these verses. So let's look at our first point first, the context of God's calendar here in verse 24. Everybody kind of getting a picture, uh, kind of everybody get, we set the stage okay for you? You're getting a kind of a, uh, some context, a perspective of where we're at or where this thing's headed? Look what he says here in the 24th verse. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. I wonder who thy people are in the holy city is. Hmm. It ain't Santa Fe, right? The city of what? Holy faith? Man, it ain't so holy anymore, huh? Anybody here in June? The month of June? That's a weird month in this, in this town. To finish the transgression and to make the end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. In one verse, you see that timeline play out. God's bringing about redemption. The issue is how and when is the redemption going to happen is what we can't lose sight of, is the perspective that we can't lose I want you to understand that this word weak, as it's spelled, does not mean a seven-day week necessarily, but it's a term that is used throughout the Bible to give us a period of time is how it's used in this context. Context always defines terms in the Bible. So what you're going to see in our time together tonight, that you're not going to be looking at a seven-day week per se, but what is referred to as the weeks of years. And that's referred, revealed to us in the book of Leviticus. It's called weeks of years, not necessarily seven days. The Hebrew word or the Hebrew definition for the word week in the Old Testament is the word heptad, H-E-P-T-A-D. Are you with me? Heptad. And it simply means this. It's seven Periods of seven weeks of years. Does that sound complicated? A little bit, huh? Should I, should I read that again? I think it's in your notes, right? Seven periods of seven weeks of years or a unit of seven weeks. So the word week in this context is defined in terms of how we use the word dozen, right? A dozen is what? 12, but 12 of what? It could be weeks of days. It could be weeks of months. It could be weeks of years. As we unpack these verses, you're going to see that what the Spirit of God is revealing to us is this whole notion of weeks of years. So keep that thought in mind, okay? Don't lose sight of that truth. So here's what I want to leave you with, and it's in your notes. The units of years or 70 weeks equals 77s. Are you with me? This is important that you get this. So one week in the context of this passage equals what? Seven years. Seven years. Look down at verse number... Um, look down at verse number... Uh, Uh, verse 27, the last verse, the one we're going to bring a conclusion to. And he, the Antichrist, in other words, he shall confirm the covenant with many for what? One week. For how long? One week. Does that mean seven days in this context? What does it mean? Seven years. Now, are you making the connection back to the tribulation period chart? Seven years. So one week in anything that we're going to read tonight is what? Seven years. Seven years. So God's going to reveal to Daniel how the time frame that he is to use in what? And how he's going to restore Israel. What's the purpose for the tribulation period? We're going to talk about this in a minute. In fact, it's in your notes. 
What is the whole purpose for the tribulation period? To restore Israel, to bring Israel back to himself. That's, this is their judgment. This has nothing to do with the church. Are you with me? My people, my city. I don't see the church anywhere in this prophecy. There's no replacement theology that needs to happen because the Bible is explicit in Daniel's prophecy that he's talking about my people, the nation of Israel, and my city. Guess what city he's referring to? Jerusalem. You'll see that in the text. So 70 weeks of years are 70 units of seven years equals how many years? 490 years. I know these, this seems really complicated, but it really, really isn't. You need to grasp this because that's going to take us to the next part. Again, the purposes for the tribulation period is revealed to us by Daniel. It's to restore the nation of Israel to himself. But we understand, need to understand how it is and the time frame that God's going to use to bring about that restoration. Don't ever forget that the tribulation is simply Israel's judgment in the Bible. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, this is after the restoration is complete. It says this, alas, for that day is great. What day is he referring to? Anybody have any idea? What day is Jeremiah referring to? What's going to be the great day for the Jews? The return of who? The Messiah. The political deliverer. He's going to deliver him from the government of the Antichrist, from all the chaos, all the craziness. Alas, he says, for that, great, that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of, what does he refer to this period? Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble. Who was Jacob? Israel. So the tribulation period is all about Israel's trouble. It's their seven years. It's God's judgment to bring them back to him. Goes on, he says, but he shall be saved out of it. Who's he? Who's he? Jacob, Israel. Look at Romans 11, verse 25. I think it's in your notes, right? Paul writes these verses to remind the church that God is not done with Israel and his plan prophetically, especially prophetically. As a matter of fact, those three chapters in the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, and 11, are parenthetical. And God stuck him right smack in the middle of the most doctrinal book that you have in your Bible in the New Testament for the church to remind us that he's not done with Israel. In chapter 9, he talks about their past. In chapter 10, their present. And 11, their future. Look what he says about their future. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest that you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. Right now, today, Israel is what? They're blinded. Do they know the Messiah? Of course not. You know what, you know what Jews are doing right now in Israel? We just raised a bunch of money for Moshe and Jonathan, these two Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Their house, one of their house churches was burned down. You know who did that? Not the Palestinians. Yeah, some Jewish Zionists. Kick these Christians out of here, man, because they're, they're, you know what they're doing? They're proclaiming the gospel. They're seeing Jews coming to Jesus. Are you with me? Blindness in part has happened to Israel until when? Watch this. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When's that going to happen? Don't confuse the fullness of the Gentiles with the times of the Gentiles. But what's the fullness of the Gentiles? We've looked at this verse a number of times in, in multiple Bible studies. It's the rapture of the church. But when the last Gentile comes to Christ, I don't know when that is. Wouldn't it be cool if that was tonight? Wouldn't it be cool? I don't know. One of these days, somebody's going to, Believe in their heart and confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus. And all of a sudden, man, you're going to hear that trumpet and that, those words and that thunder clap. And here, come up hither. There's a finite number somewhere. 
I don't know if it's in China. I don't know if, wouldn't it be cool if it was somebody from Ascend Bible Church? (laughs) But nonetheless, look at this. Verse 26, and so all Israel shall be what? Shall be saved. Does that mean every Jewish person? No, he's talking about the nation. He's talking about the entire group of people known as the nation of Israel. But along the way, there's going to be personal lives that are going to be affected. You know how they're going to be affected? Endure to the end and don't take the mark. That brings you a part of Israel. I wasn't being facetious when I said, hey, you can go build your bunker in Pekul so you can pack up your bags and move to Israel. But you're going to have to become Jewish. Because his focus in the tribulation period is all about Israel. It's all about the Jews. Look at the next part of the verse. And there shall come out of Zion what? The deliverer, the Messiah. And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. I don't see the church being mentioned in India's prophecy stuff. For this is my covenant on them when I shall take away their what? their sins. That's exactly what he's going to do. As a matter of fact, you find that in the text, right? Look at verse 24 again. God's going to do six specific things with Israel and Jerusalem. He's going to finish the transgression. He's going to make an end to sins. He's going to make reconciliation for for iniquity. He's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. He's going to seal up the vision and prophecy of the Lord. He's completely done and he's going to anoint the most holy. When does he do that? When does he do that? I know you know. Come on, man. Think about your chart. At the second coming of Christ. Leading into the millennium. He's going to make it all right, man. He's going to square everything up, man. So that's your context, if you will. I just want to, again, it's important that you define that term. How much, how, so in our context, as we look at this whole week thing, how long, how long, how long is a week? Seven years. Mark that down. Because now we're going to get into the heart of the text. So this is, we're going to talk now about how the, how the Lord counts. How his calendar works. Look with me here in verse number 25. Know therefore and understand that from the beginning forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be what? Seven weeks. Seven weeks. And three score and two weeks. For this street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. Is how verse 25 reads. So here's, a, here's something that I want you to consider now that we just read the, the, this verse or these next two verses. Here's a principle that you need to understand in how God counts time. Are you ready for this? You see it in your notes? God has a clock. Just like that clock up there that I depend on every Wednesday night and every Sunday morning. Mostly on Sunday mornings, I ignore it. Right? Guys looking at your watch. When's this guy going to finish? Might be Some of you may be thinking that about it tonight, but that's okay. But God has a clock, and his clock only runs... When God is dealing directly with the nation of Israel. Did you catch that? Gentiles have a role in God's plan and God's purpose. But when God's clock, when God is keeping track of time, it all has to do with the nation of Israel. And he does it in these chunks of times. So the divisions of Jewish history, God always deals with Israel in segments of, are you ready for this? 490 years. Do you remember that from the 70 of the multiple weeks? Right? Verse 25 again. Now therefore, and understand from the beginning forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem the Messiah of Prince, which will be what? Seven weeks and three score and two weeks. How, much, how long is seven weeks? No. 49. Right? Hang with me, man. This really matters. This, this, what we're talking about is really, really important. So here's a chart I want to throw up on the screen real quick. And, and Larry, could you put up that, um, 
the 70 weeks of scripture chart, this is really important because you're going to see that there's four significant 490 year periods of time where God is counting. The first one is from Abraham to Exodus. And you know what's amazing historically? They're down to the day. Exactly 490 years. So from the book of Genesis chapter number 12 to the Exodus is exactly 490 years. So if you look at this, how old was Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 verse 4? How old was he? 75 years old. And then the Bible speaks of the covenant being established. And it's revealed to us in the New Testament, Galatians 3.17, for 430 years. 505 years total. And you have to subtract 15 years. Why? Because of the time that Ishmael usurped God's program or God's plan. So those total of 505 years, you subtract the 15 years where Ishmael was in control. Who was I talking to? It was Jack tonight but talking about Ishmael. The Quran. Did you know that there's a battle between the Bible and the Quran? He was sharing with me where you read it in some magazine, Jack, or, or you heard it on the radio that the Arabs or Islam believes that it was Ishmael that was sacrificed on the Mount Moriah, which is where the Dome of the Rock is today. What does the Bible teach? That it was Isaac, right? Isaac was whose dad? Jacob. And Jacob fathered who? The 12 sons of, of each tribe. Are you with me? See how really simple this is? So the first 490 years where God is counting is from Abraham to the Exodus. The Exodus happens, and from the Exodus to the dedication of Solomon's temple is another 490 years. 480 years from Joshua to the Judges. The temple was built 10 years later, and that gives you your 490 years. It took them 10 years from 1 Kings chapter 6 to the actual dedication of the temple, which brings you to another 490 years. And then the third element or the third part of his clock is from the dedication of Solomon's temple to the edict of Artaxerxes. This is an important one to understand because this is where Daniel's picks up. You just read about this guy, right? This was a Persian king who provided an edict to the Jews to go do what? To go back to the land and what? Rebuild a temple. I know this seems complicated, but it really isn't because that little chart on page 20 is really key in understanding it. So you see this whole place. It was 490 years total, 70 years of captivity. Brings us to 560 years, right? Subtract the 70 years of the captivity and you get to 490 Again, the Bible just doing some really, really cool things. God counting when Israel is what? Is in the land. Is in the land. Now, this next chart you're familiar with because this is where we're going to unpack the chapter. And it looks like this. It's it's on page 20. You need to understand this chart. You need to grasp the 70 weeks of Daniel. So from the edict of Artaxerxes, this is the range of those 490 years to what? To what? To the second coming of Christ. So what we did for you on that chart on page 20, we just broke down those last 490 years of biblical Jewish history. So here's what I want you to understand, right? As you look at Daniel 9.24, look at 9.24 again. Let's start looking at this and unpacking these verses. Seventy weeks are determined, right? We already defined the 70 weeks, right? What are they? Seventy times seven is what? Right? Seventy times seven is what? Not 49. 490. So there's your 490 years. There's your 400, that's Daniel 9.24. Now as you start to drill down to 9.25, 
Look at the first part of the verse in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to what? To restore, to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be how long? Seven weeks. weeks. Or how many years? 49. From From the rebuilding of Jerusalem to what? To the Messiah. Look at the rest, the rest of the verse. To Messiah the Prince shall be three score and two weeks. How much is a score? 20. What's three score? 60. And, and what? And two. 62 times seven is what? 434. That gets you to how many years? 483. So as you get to 43 in these two verses, right? In Daniel 24 and Daniel 9.25, you know what we're missing? How much are we missing? We're missing seven years. I wonder where those seven years are. Tribulation period. Tribulation period. So there's this gap. Let's look at verse 26 real quick. And after three score and two weeks, right? There's three score and two weeks. Shall Messiah be cut off? That's where he was cut off. Can you back up, please, Larry? I I, I don't know. know, We're just going to read it from the Bible. Put it back on the chart because I'm going to point to the chart, please. Thank you. And after three score and two weeks, and shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince shall come that shall destroy the city, right? When did that happen? Anybody remember? We read about it in Matthew chapter 24, verse number what? Number two. Anybody remember when then? Who did that? The Romans, when? In 70 AD, right? Are you guys with me? Is this making sense? Is this complicated? Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. Go figure, right? Because did you guys hear Larry's message from a couple of weeks ago? What was his text? Isaiah what? Isaiah 53. Man, how they miss that, I have no clue, man. How they miss it, I have no idea. Why is that? Why are they not seeing this? Exactly. Who said that again? Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Do you guys remember being blinded? I do. You know what? I walk around this town, even around this church, and you know what I see a lot of times? A bunch of people just living in the matrix. <laughs> Seriously. Just existing, man. Yeah. And there's all this spiritual stuff happening right before our eyes, and we're just walking like nothing's going to end, like nothing's going to change. Man, do we not realize what's going on in this planet? Everything that Jesus just laid out in Matthew 24, and where we find ourselves... And we're thinking that everything's going to be, if you think your, your 401k or 62k or whatever they're called today is going to be there in a few months or years, man, good luck. I'm not banking on it. You know what I'm banking on? Being in his presence. That's all I care about. Maybe when I leave instructions for whoever finds my house and my belongings, I'm going to tell them you could have all my stuff. Also, I would recommend that you pack up your stuff and move to Israel. (laughs) But there will be some stuff. Don't forget that after the rapture, there's going to be three, there's going to be three and a half years of what? Peace Peace and prosperity. Till when? The abomination of desolation. Wait till we get, wait till we get to. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know what the Jews are going to be doing with this guy known as the Antichrist? We're going to talk about the Antichrist next week, by the way. You know what they're going to be doing with him? They're going to be worshiping him. Guess who they're, going to, they're worshiping him as? The Messiah. The counterfeit kingdom. How many times have you guys have seen that chart on a Wednesday night? He's going to counterfeit the kingdom of heaven. He's going to counterfeit the literal kingdom on this earth. 
for three and a half years. And then he's going to reveal himself and he's going to unleash hell. And that's where Matthew 24 comes in. So are you with me? Is everybody tracking? So there's 400 to 80. There's this gap between the 69th and 70th week. You know when the 70th week is revealed to us? In Daniel 9.27. Look at Daniel 9.27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? One week. For one week. See the separation between the 69 weeks and the 70th week. This is why we refer to this particular chart. I think it's in your booklet as the what? The 70th week of Daniel or Daniel's 70th week. Here's my point. That one week, that seven-year tribulation, this is why it's seven years. I've heard guys get up there and say, no, it's only three and a half. It's only this. It's only that. No. The Bible just revealed to you how long it is, who it's for, and who the players are and where it's all going to play out. Daniel chapter 9. If you want to plug the church in there, have at it, man. But I don't see her anywhere. This is a Jewish period of time, a Jewish judgment, and God bringing Israel back into the fold. Messiah. Look at verse 27. Verse 26. And after three score and 60 and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off? There's the cross. But not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy. That was Titus. The city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And under the end of the war, desolations are determined. And, and he, who's the he? The Antichrist shall confirm the covenant. Do you notice it's the confirmation of a con- covenant and not the establishment of one? Guess where the establishment of the covenant is actually happening right now? Yeah. Did you guys watch Biden yesterday? There will be a covenant. There will be a um, contract, an agreement to divvy up the land. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, for seven years. And in the midst of the week, what's the midst of the week? The middle of the week. In the middle of the week, check it out. Right here. That's the middle of the week. Seven, three and a half years, counterfeit. The other three and a half years, great tribulation. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Look at the rest of the verse. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice of the oblation to cease, the abomination of desolation. This is the verse that Jesus was referring to in Matthew chapter, in Matthew 24, verse 15, by the way. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out unto the desolate. Verse 27. So, that is Daniel's 70th week. One week equals seven years. The Antichrist will establish a, a covenant Next week, we will introduce you to who he is and how things are going to play out. You're going to see how Isaiah refers to this covenant as a covenant of death and hell. And uh, in the midst of the week, all hell is going to break loose. Again, Matthew Matthew 24, verses 15 through 22. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel... By Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And let him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to his clothes. And woe unto him that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter neither on the Sabbath, for then shall be great tribulation, such as not seen since the beginning of the world to this time, 
no nor shall ever be. And except those days shall be shortened, there shall be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. It's going to be a crazy time. So that's what we're going to be diving into starting next week. We were going to jump right into chapter number six. Next week, we're going to look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And just understand, please, 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 after tonight's time together in this passage, never forget the context of those chapters and who it's written into and its purpose and uh, why the book of Revelation exists. And more importantly, not more importantly, but just as importantly, the purpose for the tribulation period. All right? Wow, we finished early which is a new one. We have questions, Sonia or Ollie? Do we want to do a mic? I think we do, huh? Is that okay, Ollie? So we can get, so the people that are online can hear you. I think the one with the round, yeah, that, that one should work. Did they know what, which one it is? Do a mic check. We should have done a mic check, mic test. No? Is there, a, is there a round one there somewhere? I don't know where it is. It's got a round head to it. Is that the one? We call it the house mic. Is it back there? Jay, it's not back there somewhere? Okay, that's the one. That's the one. Yo. Yep. Was that a burp or was that something? Wrong? <laughs> Yo. Holly. Can you connect for me uh, when the third temple is built? Mm -hmm. When uh, the uh, abomination of desolation, the beginning of the last, the great tribulation, uh -huh. will the Antichrist. Hold it to you. Will the Antichrist <coughs> be, uh, be uh, ta uh, taking over? The third temple and sitting there as as God. Control, mm -hmm. as God. Yeah. Uh, take take your Bibles and uh, did everybody kind of hear all these questions? Kind of connect the dots in terms of the temple. Here's here's the bottom line. Um, I can't tell you of any religious Jew, not so much the Zionists, because the Zionists are more about the theology of the land. Um, for the most part, a lot of them are secular. Um, they're, more, they're there um, to basically embrace the, the, the idea or the notion of a Jewish homeland. Um, what's so cool about how the Lord is working, how God is working, he's using the land to bring them back unbeknownst to them. You see that in the book of, the book of Obadiah. And again, all you have to do is look at recent history and how God has... Um, has really converged some really neat um, events to bring this whole thing about. Um, so as you look at that timeline, uh, the dispensational one, could you bring that up real quick, Larry? Um, the dispensational one. Um, you see Israel after uh, the Gospels and in the book of Acts um, fall into uh, a diaspora. They're dispersed to the four winds as a matter of fact, I think I've got some thoughts in your notes. Um, where is it that I've got it? Um, yeah, look down at 26B, the destruction of Jerusalem. We talked about in 70 AD, we know it as the diaspora. And a lot of things happened immediately after the Romans came down and uh, destroyed the city of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, uh, um, there were a group of um, Jewish, assassin, uh, Jewish assassins known as the Sicarii. Um, they held these daggers and they were masters at using it. There's, in fact, there was a movie of, of um, a Mexican assassin recently. It was called Sicario. Anybody seen that movie recently? It's, it's kind of uh, gory, isn't it? But um, this guy, I, don't, I forget the actor's name, but anyway, he typified the approach that um, these Jewish assassins known as the Sicarii 
would take in what became known as this very short period known as the War of the Jews. If you guys love history, and I would recommend that you embrace it, there's a book written by Flavius Josephus that he because he existed during this period. He was around during this period. He wrote a book known as The War of the Jews, where the Jews were fighting back against the Romans. And um, this is where the whole thing plays out. It's not documented in the Bible because we know from the book of Acts, after the crucifixion, after the Gospels, the church is birthed in Acts chapter number 2. God begins to move to the Gentile world No longer is Jerusalem significant. Why? Because Jerusalem is now destroyed. And all those Jews that were living in Judea and in Jerusalem are scattered to the four winds. You know where a lot of them ended up? In a place called Gamla up north near the Sea of Galilee. I don't know if you guys remember. Remember that really steep hike that we took down those steps? Did you ever go there, Dolores, to Gamla? What I found fascinating about Gamla, really fascinating to me, um, as we stood on the top of this peak looking down and we made it down to a synagogue that had been destroyed by the Romans, as a matter of fact, completely destroyed. And you guys will get to see this place. It's really awesome. But it really sits up on this beautiful hilltop and you're looking into the valleys and all of a sudden we started to see these birds flying out of these kind of nests, caves or whatever. And um, they're called griffin vultures and uh, what's really crazy is they have been mighty they have been migrating in huge numbers in recent years well isaiah speaks of the vultures eating the bodies of the nations as they all end up meeting and we're going to study this in revelation chapter when we get to revelation chapter 19 in the, Bad- in, the Je- in the Jezreel Valley. Well, Gamla is only a few miles away from the Jezreel Valley or where the Battle of Armageddon is going to happen. And those vultures are showing up today in huge numbers. Just in the last year's year, they've broken all these numbers. So what's God doing? He's preparing that part of the world for his return. So Gamla is a strategic place during the days of the War of the Jews, and another significant place, those Jews that were up in Gamla that were finally pushed out of the northern part of Israel ended up in Judea in a place called Masada. Remember when we went to Masada? This mountaintop place that were completely surrounded by Jews. I think there's a movie out there probably on Prime or one of those programs called Masada, which is the story of these Jews that isolated themselves from the Romans. And to this day, you could be on top of Masada, look down. We should bring some pictures up next time, or we will when we get there. But there's these ramparts. There's these huge, um, what are they called? J.D., can you help me? These, these things where the Romans would set up their, um, their catapults right, right up to the walls. I mean, it's amazing what they did. And you see the, you see the formations of these these walls and the, the, uh, the foundations of all the Roman garrisons that surrounded that, that mountain for years. And they finally were able to break through. And you know what the Jews did that were up in Masada? They all committed suicide instead of giving up to the Romans. But they fought valiantly for years. So while all that stuff is happening in Jerusalem and in Judea, the gospel's going out to Turkey and to Greece and your whole New Testament is becoming very prevalent. And guess what begins to happen to the Jews? They're dispersed. The Jews that stayed in the Middle East and made their way to North Africa, they're referred to as the what, Dolores? The Sephardic Jews. Where are, where did also, where's another place that the Sephardic Jews end up? In Spain. I find it interesting that in the book of Obadiah, the only place where you find the Sephardim mentioned by name is in the book of Obadiah. And you know what they're doing? They're returning back to the Negev, which is that part of Israel that they were from before the diaspora. And you know where a lot of those Jews are from? Northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. These are crypto-Jews, Jews that came across with 
uh, Columbus in 14, not with Columbus. And it's that same year that Columbus was out discovering the Americas was the same exact year that King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella sent out an edict known as the Edict of Expulsion telling all the Jews you either convert to Catholicism or you leave. It was called the Edict of Expulsion. A lot of them said, no, man, we like it here. And they converted, kind of pseudo-ish, to Catholicism. And a lot of them were persecuted heavily, right? We know about the Inquisition and the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was just not about Christians, but also about the persecution of Jews. And a lot of them ended up in Monterrey, Mexico. That was a hotbed of crypto Jews and as a matter of fact, there was a Jewish, Spanish Jewish leader that was prominent in allowing these Jews that were making their way back from Spain and North Africa to settle in that part of the country. And when some of the Spanish leaderships and the Spanish leaders that recognized what was going on in Mont- Monterrey, you know what they began to do? They began to persecute them in Monterrey. And guess where they went? Santa Fe. Taos, Alamosa, Colorado, north, they, as far away as possible to Monterrey, northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. Sephardim. A lot of these crypto Jews, that are people, Hispanics that have embraced their Jewishness, guess where they're going back to? The Negev. You go today and there's kibbutzes of... Hispanic, northern New Mexico, southern Colorado Hispanics that are embracing their Sephardic Jews and and going back. And then there's another group that made their way from Jerusalem to northern Israel into Turkey, ultimately Greece, and into Europe. They're known as the Askezani Jews or the European Jews. They're the ones that pretty much run the government to this day. Right? It's the Askezani Jews that are of European descent. If you remember Golda Meir and uh, Ben Gurion and some of the early fathers, Theodore Herzl, who was the father of modern day Jar- J- Zionism, these were all European Jews who were referred to as Askezani. And you see that group mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter number 10, not from a Jewish perspective, but from a Gentile European perspective, Askezani. So they're the ones, they're all moving back, they're all getting back to Israel as part of this plan. And one of the things, getting back to all these questions, then we'll we'll get you, Ezra, is the whole idea now that they're all gathered together and most of the more religious people that are moving there, right? We know them as the what? The Orthodox? Or those folks, the ones that are wearing the black garb, the ones with the, the curly curls, they are pushing heavily heavily for the rebuilding of a third temple. As a matter of fact, I would recommend this website. It's called templemounts.org. All the objects of furniture that were used to furnish the temple from the table, from the uh, altar of sacrifice all the way, except for the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody really seems to know where that is. The Bible tells you where it is if they would just read the Bible, Right? All those objects of furniture are in place today. Who's going to Israel in February? We will make it a point to go visit the templemount.org. You know where it sits? Right at the, in the Jewish quarter, facing the the Western Wall, as you look down into the the courtyard. So it's going to be really cool because you'll actually see the, the, uh, the elements or the ornaments of the temple that are going to be there. So you know what they're waiting for, Ollie? And I'm going to show you. I'm not sure when I'll do it. But I'm going to show you a really interesting video of how these Jews, rabbinical Jews, religious Jews, um, are waiting for the Messiah. And you know what this one rabbi says? He's not God. He's a man. And he's a peacekeeper and he's going to bring about peace. Guess who he's already looking to? Are you with me? Isn't that, see the deception already playing out. Little do they know. I'm thinking to myself, dude, haven't you read your Bible? 
Haven't you ever read Isaiah chapter 9, <laughs> verses 6 and 7, for gosh sakes? Right? How could you be so blind? They're blinded. But it's in your Old Testament, dude. So he's going to be worshipped as God. 2 Thessalonians 2, and then we'll talk to you, Ezra. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The temple, that third temple, will be rebuilt. Will we see that? Maybe. What we won't see is the worshiping of this dude known as the Antichrist. We'll get to this passage on some Sunday morning in a few months. I promise. Wouldn't it be cool if the rapture happened before we have to read about this guy? But look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Again, you're going to get the context right away real quick. Paul writes these words. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? There's your context. And by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, he's reminding these believers, man, that the rapture could happen any day. It's imminent. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, that that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin will be revealed the son of perdition. Who do you think that guy is? the antichrist right he's going to tell you how and when he's going to be revealed here in a minute but look at verse four who opposeth and exalteth so what paul is doing in this passage he's just shedding light and bringing to perspective some of the things that jesus said would happen in matthew 24 and what we just read in daniel 9 whoso opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called god right that's this antichrist We're going to talk about him in great detail next week. Or that he is worshipped so that he as God, ready for this, Ollie? For for he as God sitteth in the what? In the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the temple has to be in place in order for this this, um, verse to come to fruition. Again, I'm a literalist. And I take verse 4 literally. And all you have to do is be mindful of how the Jews are preparing to build that third temple. Now here's what's interesting or here's what's happening with the Abrahamic Accords just to make you aware. And this is why this particular government, Netanyahu's government, has not signed off on the Accords which would require, which would mean, um, which would mean uh, dividing up the land. What does that mean? There will be a Palestinian state somewhere within what we know as the land of Israel. Right now, today, there is no such thing as a Palestine. There's never been a Palestine. There's a Palestinian people. What you can't lose sight of is history again because the land of Israel, what we know today as the land of Israel was always known as the land of Israel until you get to the diaspora, until you get to the book of Acts, the war of the Jews. So when the Romans took control... Some 40 years later, a Roman emperor named by the name of Caligula says, you know what, we're not going to call this Israel anymore because Rome always hates Israel, right? We know that. We know that from history. We know that from the Bible. The Romans always despise Israel. They despise the Jews. Man, if I could just take the time tonight to just lay that whole thing out, you would be blown away with how how much they persecuted the Jews, right? We know about Catholic Spain and Catholic Italy and the Inquisition. That being said, he says, you know what? We're not going to call it Israel anymore. You know what we're going to call it? The land of the Philistines, i.e. Palestine. So from the first century A.D. till 1948, that piece of land was known as Palestine. Now here's what you can't lose sight of. Palestinians never controlled Palestine. It's always been controlled by an external power. The Turks for almost 600 years, um, the Europeans shortly thereafter, the Brits specifically, before that, the, the Arabs. A great movie that I would recommend that you watch, The Kingdom of Heaven, Orlando Bloom plays in it, and his, um, his battle, the, you remember the Crusades? What was the whole purpose for the Crusades? To take back Jerusalem for Christendom, for Rome. So, 1948 happens, right? May 14th, 1948. 
And finally, the name Israel makes it back on a map. And how, long, how many years has that been? 75 years now? Recent history. We're there, is my point. We are so there. So the temple we will be rebuilt. In 1948, they got the land back. The Battle of Independence, the War of Independence. Not the battle, but the War of Independence. 1967, the Six-Day War, you know what they got back? What was the significant event in, in the Six-Day War? In fact, we're going to take you to the Jaffa Gate. They got the Western Wall. No, no, you know what they got back? They got Jerusalem back. There's bullet holes on the Jaffa Gate from that battle. You'll get to see some of that really cool stuff. So they got Jerusalem back in 67 in what we know today is the Six-Day War. You know what the missing piece is? The only missing piece. Anybody have any idea? The Temple Mount. That's it. The Temple Mount, so that this verse that we just read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 could come to fruition. So who controls the Temple Mount? The Arabs. There's two mosques up there. The Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is where they believe Muhammad ascended. The Quran never says that he ascended from the Temple Mount. Never said that. You know what it does say? That he ascended into heaven from a faraway place. But the Arabs or Islam has claimed it as the Temple Mount. <laughs> and then the other significant mosque, the one that we're all familiar with, the Golden Dome, the Dome, the Dome of the Rock. In fact, we have a really cool picture of it in my office. That the reason why it's called the Dome of the Rock because inside the Dome of the Rock there's this massive rock and that's where Islam teaches that Abraham sacrificed Ishmael. Our Bible teaches us what? That's where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. Genesis 22. There's the distinction. There's the, there's the divide. So... Fascinating, huh? Because what we've just heard is everything that we just read about where the Lord tells Isaiah, there's no difference between history and prophecy. It's all just one big thing to him and he's going to redeem it all. He's going to make, make it all happen and we have the privilege of living when we live so that we can witness and see it all play out is what's really cool. And I know a lot of us are dealing with a bunch of crazy stuff in our lives, but man, please, please, please don't lose focus. Don't lose sight and don't lose perspective of the fact that his plan is coming to fruition right before our eyes. So Ezra, your turn. I'm sorry. Did you forget? <laughs> did, uh, first of all, Ollie, did we answer your question? I hope so. Yeah, yeah but No. <laughs> It's going to be during the tribulation period. Yeah. That's the counterfeit kingdom. Right. That's the first three and a half years. If we keep reading in Thessalonians, just could I keep going just a little bit for Ollie? Watch this. We're going to cover this when we get there. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, Paul says, right? He's taking them back to the first letter of Thessalonians. And know ye not that without, with, and know ye and now ye know that withhold it that he might be revealed in his time. He will be revealed. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Remember this verse? We talked about it. Doth already work when we were talking about the seven churches, the seven periods of church history. The devil's already been working. He never, he never stops. He never, he never sleeps. In your life, in my life, on this planet. Why? Because he's the squatter, man. He wants to control. He wants to have the throne of God. Look at the next verse. For the mystery of iniquity doth already weak, who, and only he who now letteth will let until he be what? Taken out of the way. Who is restraining? Who's the restrainer that's keeping him from being revealed? The Holy Spirit of God. Where's the Holy Spirit of God? In you. So one of these days, the Holy Spirit's going to leave with you, or he's going to lead you out of here. And the world's going to see this guy and they're going to accept him for who he is, which is this false king, this false kingdom, this counterfeit king. He counterfeits anything and everything that God does in the Bible, including his word. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When does that happen? 
the second half of the tribulation period at the second coming of Christ. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with what? All power and signs and lying wonders. There's a warning, man. Pastor Mike has been doing a bang-up job on reminding us of getting caught up with all this stuff that we see going on in the world today. Huh? If it's not biblical, mark it, man. Know his word so that you can have the discernment. Okay, Ezra, your turn. The book of Ezra. I was going to say, when they, um, when they said that you have to convert or you or leave, uh -huh. how long did they have to wait? Convert or leave? Yeah, when they were in, in Spain. Oh, when they were in Spain? Um, I have no clue. How long did they have to pretend that they were? Yeah, oh, they, they moved to the new world. But, but again, what does the word crypto mean, right? Anybody of you in here own, own a little bit of Bitcoin? Why is it called cryptocurrency? Or are you Venmo people? Not Venmo so much anymore because now PayPal's in bed with Venmo, right? But how about, what about Cash App? Some of those. What does the word crypto mean? Secret. Secret, it means hidden, right? So, yeah, you guys that use Cash App or whatever, those other little, it's, crypto, it's called cryptocurrency for a reason because it's hidden from, don't worry, they're going to destroy all that stuff. That's off the subject. Why were they referred to as the crypto Jews? They had to hide to survive. So yeah, they embraced the whole Catholic thing just to make their way here, and they made their way here, but they still practiced their Jewishness. Some of them embraced it and stayed there though, right? Of course. Absolutely. How long did they have to pretend? Like now they're not having to pretend, right? No, I mean, there's a lot of Jews that probably converted to Catholicism, right? A lot. I mean, that happened throughout Europe, but a lot of, sta a lot of them stayed true to their Jewishness. A lot of them externally would do the Catholic thing, like go to Mass or whatever, but at home they celebrated the feasts. But they don't, they don't have to pretend now, right? No, no. It's America. It's a free country for now. For who knows how much longer, but it is. But I mean in Spain. The ones that oh, stayed. in Spain? Oh, I don't know. No, Spain is. Yeah. Are they, still, are they still there pretending? Oh, no. Yeah. Keep in mind that throughout history, a lot of Jews have converted to other religions. Um, I, you're, if you're Jewish today, I mean, Diego will tell you this. Man, you go to places like Rabat in Morocco. Morocco is one of those really unique places. Arab countries, there are still synagogues in Morocco, believe it or not. Can you imagine that? You will never see a synagogue in Saudi Arabia or in Iran. There were synagogues in, in um, what's the capital of Iran? Tehran. Tehran, before the Iraq war. A lot of those Jews left Iran. Uh, there were synagogues. There were synagogues in uh, in Iraq. Some of those secular Muslim countries, and I call them secular because guys like Saddam Hussein and and uh, the Persian king, what was he called, um, the Shah, the Shah of Iran. There was no there wasn't a religious bone in their body. It wasn't until the religious crowd came in where they started to push other religions out. Right? Can't be a Christian in Iran today. Um, you couldn't, you, you'd have to hide to be a Jew in Iran today. But it wasn't that long ago there were still synagogues in those places. There was a synagogue, are you ready for this? Just outside of Mosul. I don't know if you remember this, but when ISIS took over Mosul, they blew up uh, the tomb of, um, of um, why am I forgetting his name? Jonah, thank you, Mike. They blew up the tomb of Jonah, those jerks. Yeah, this so Jewish this, prophet this. who Arabs had embraced having his tomb all those years. So it's just the weird world we live in today, right? What did he say? And what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24 and verse number seven? That there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and nation will war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Why does he draw a distinction between nations and kingdoms? Because they're different. Here's something to consider. Nationalism, nations, the word et nation means ethnic or ethnicity, is always connected, or most of the time, 90% of the time is connected to a religion. To be Hispanic is to be what? 
Catholic, right? To be an Arab is to be what? Right? To be Russian is to be what? Orthodox. Are you with me? The stuff going on with Russia right now, there isn't a communist bone in Putin's, there isn't a single communist bone in Putin's, but he grew up in this former Soviet Union under communism. He despises communism. What he is, he's a religious fanatic right now. He's a nationalist. You know who got into his head? A guy by the name, you should study this guy, Alexander Dugan. You know where Alexander Dugan was during the Soviet era? In a, in a, in a, in a Soviet prison. Because he was pushing for the return of the monarchy. King Nicholas and what they did with them. Why? Because the king was all about what? Religion. The Eastern Church. Why is it that the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians have a ton of neo-Nazis in their, in their thing? You know why? Why did so many embrace Nazism? Did you know that there was an entire SS division? An SS division during World War II that allied themselves with the Nazis, Ukrainian soldiers. I would encourage you to do this. Study this group, the Azov, A-Z-O-V, the, the Sea of Azov, which is on the other side of the Crimean Peninsula. The Azov Battalion. You know what they're full of? Nazis. Neo-Nazis. Are you with me? Where did that come from? Where are these guys from? Western Ukraine. Who's west? What country is west of Ukraine? Poland. Poland, Poland is what? Roman Catholic. Where did, the, where did the Nazis begin? Anybody know? Munich. Bavaria. The hotbed of Nazism. The Jesuits. I'm gonna probably going to go to jail after tonight. <laughs> it's all good. Are you with me? Nation against nation. This war did not start in February of 2022. You know what it started? In 1054 AD in what became known as the Great Schism. Now you're telling me, well, there's Ukrainians that are Eastern Orthodox. You know what? Those Eastern Orthodox churches in Western Ukraine, they're known as Uniates. Their loyalty is not to the Eastern Church or some Eastern Orthodox patriarch. Their loyalty is to Rome. Why did Zelensky and the German president make their way to the Vatican before coming back to get more money from the U.S.? Another $26 billion. New world order. New world religion. New world temple. The chess pieces are falling into place, man. And we get to witness it. So get your head out of the sand. Get out of the matrix. Chiefs stink anyway. They lost to the Detroit Lions. <laughs> Nothing really matters anymore. Are you guys with me? Let's focus on God's plan and his purpose. Amen. Because more than anything else, you know, what this, you know what this lost and blind world needs? It needs Christ because of the grace period. Are you ready for this? The grace period is almost over. It's a good way to look at the church age, huh? A grace period. Ron. Did it die? No. Is it likely? Oh, oh, yeah. Here it is. So you told us this before. You should be on radio. Yeah. You have a radio voice. <laughs> um, you told us this before, but what is the significance of seven? Mm -hmm. seven. It, what does that mean? The number seven, what does it represent? Yeah, you, there's a little chart here. Okay, that's where it was. I and was it's looking on page it. number. Uh, it's on page number 16. There's a cool 16. little basic numerology chart. The number seven oh, always... That's right represents perfection or completion, right? This is why every, God does everything in seven, seven days, seven, the seven sevens, the seven weeks. Seven, seven, seven is the key. What's the devil's oh, number? Completion or perfection. What's the devil's number? What's the number of man? Oh, Look six. at the number six. Yeah. The number of man, right? We're going to okay. unpack that number when we get to Revelation 13, verse 18. Okay, and then, and then you were talking about how 490 has been an important number yeah, yeah. in Israel. And so, like, when Jesus was talking about forgiveness, and so we're supposed to forgive until 70 times 7, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that cool? And so... Um, 490 times. 490 times. Um, so does that have any connection at all with what we were talking about, or is that just as part of 
I, I, that special That's a number. good question. We'd have to kind of I study it out and unpack it because <laughs> I know that my 491st time happened just this morning. Yeah. I woke up this morning. I asked her to forgive me for, the rest, for anything I do for the rest of the day. <laughs> I learned that from Pastor Mike. And Larry, forgive me for what I'm going to do today. Yeah. So everything's good. <laughs> um, well, that's my... <laughs> Is it kind of like, forgive me for the sin I'm about to commit? That's it. Is that kind of like <laughs> kind of like that? that yeah. Is? Well, I, another question I have too is um, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I don't oh, know about did, the connection yeah. between the seventy times seven. Or yeah, maybe yeah. that's just been a go- yeah. ongoing number yeah. in Israel. But seven's a significant number that. in Scripture. Oh, okay. It's all over the place. It's, Man, it shows up over and over and over in Revelation, right? The seven, the seven churches, the seven candlesticks, the seven, um, the seven spirits of God. All over and over and over, we see the number seven in Revelation. It's God unveiling his nature, his attributes, himself, right? That's what the book of Revelation is about, God revealing his, um, himself to us. Cool. Does that well, and I just had one other question. Sure. So, when, so in the past, when I've been reading, of course, coming from my background and everything too, mm-hmm. but... Um, in chapter 24, when he's talking about, when they're talking about when, when mm. shall your coming be, and he yeah. starts talking about the end of the world. Um, some, for some reason, I get that mixed up with what happened in Jerusalem mm-hmm. after Christ was crucified, right? Yeah. And after all of that occurred, and then Jerusalem right. was destroyed, basically, or the Jews were. Yeah. Um, is that. He prophesies of, about. He prophesies about the destruction of Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. Which happens 40 years later in 70 AD, Yeah. right? But then you find places like what we just read in the book of Daniel tonight and all of the book of Revelation, which which talks about the destruction that's going to happen in Jerusalem post-70 AD. Because the book of Revelation isn't in anybody's hands until 90 AD. That's when that revelation happened. Are you with me? So that's how you know it's prophetic. Okay, so it's now were there, were there like two up, uh, abominations of desolation? Yes, there was a picture um, of um, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes in 35 AD. He sacrificed a pig, the abomination of desolation. And uh, we know that caused and what became known. What you don't find is it documented in the Bible because it had happened between the Testaments, Right. Remember, between the Old and New Testament, there's a period known as the silent period where there was no revelation from God for 400 years. That happens in about 45 B.C. And then in 38 B.C., the Maccabean revolt happened, right? Have you guys, you guys have a Catholic Bible at home? Some of you? Inside your Catholic Bible, there should be a book called the Book of First Maccabees. It's part of the Apocrypha. In other words, the word apocrypha means unknown origin. But it's a good historical account of what happened and what we know today as the Maccabean revolt. And this is where the Jews celebrate at Christmas time. They celebrate what? Hanukkah. Hanukkah is not a Jewish feast. It's a festival that is celebrated because of the Maccabean revolt. That is just really interesting to me. And then they, um, and I don't want to hog all the time but no, you're okay. <laughs> but um so it's interesting so they had the one where the the pig was sacrificed yeah. in the temple that was done but, but then another de- abomination desolation that's when they have another kind of pig of sorts exactly <laughs> that's sitting prophetically there. right because yeah. again keep in mind yeah. that happens in that happens in 45 bc what we're reading about, what Jesus is writing about, and he's showing up in 33 AD. 33, yeah. And then in the book of Revelation, obviously, um, you know. Another pig? Yeah. <laughs> so does I'm not sure you know. what the, I don't, I'm not sure it'll be a pig, but there, he's going to desecrate but the he's temple. He's going to desecrate right? it, yeah. The Holy of Holies. Yeah, one of the crazy things that you experience when you go to Israel, it's really cool. There's this one little tour that you could do that's outside of the itinerary that we have. We'll try to take a group down there. It's in the evenings. Um, we're able to go into the, the bottom parts of the Temple Mount. And there's this one little section where you'll see candles and all kinds of stuff happening and some women praying. 
they believe that this little area is right below the most holy place, the holy of holies. See, they can't get to the, they can't get to the top of the mount, right? So in, in their heart, in their mind, this is the closest they could get to the most holy place. And it, it's crazy. So, um, yeah, because it's, it's controlled by who? By, by Islam. Right? So it's happening, man. We're getting to see all this stuff play out. It's really cool. Jack. Fast question. Fast question. Uh, regarding the There's mas- never a fast answer. You know that. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Masada. Uh-huh. Uh, doesn't the Israeli Defense Forces nowadays, oh, yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. Re- uh, when they take an oath, uh, mm-hmm. it's regarding Masada saying never again? Yes. Is it, uh, good point, Jack. Um, every every s- soldier, airman, naval person that joins the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, you've been in Masada, right? J- JD? Yeah. The, when they go up and they pledge allegiance to the nation, they do it at Masada. And they close their pledge with the phrase, never again. And there was never again will we experience a Holocaust. Little do they know, right? Tribulation period is going to make the Holocaust look like a picnic, man. A romp in a Girl Scout playground or whatever. Uh, one mm-hmm. other question, John. Uh-huh. Is, um, like the book of Daniel, it... it Specific, specifically is about the Jewish state, the is, 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 Israel. Yes. A lot of uh, pastors, denominations nowadays uh, are trying to do away with the, new, uh, the Old Testament, aren't they? Yes. Oh, I mean, it's they, crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. So, yeah. And that's probably yeah. one of the reasons because yeah. they're, uh, they want to take the place yeah. of, the, yeah. of the Jewish state. How? I don't, I don't know. How that, yeah, I don't get it, but whatever. I won't mention any names. I mean, I don't hate to put these pastors down, but this guy named Andy Stanley is the main guy behind it all. <laughs> By the way, you know who his father was? Charles Stanley. Really awesome preacher that I used to listen to all the time. Isn't that sad? Tell me again that the Bible isn't coming through, coming true, right? First Thessalonians 2 7. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. There's a video of him saying, man. Show me in the Bible where the Bible says that we need to meet together as a church. The church means assembly, right? He's saying, ah, just stay home, do whatever. You don't have to go to church. You can worship God. He actually said this. So I don't know what's going to happen in the coming weeks and months. Wanting to shut us down, do whatever. We're not going to shut down. We're not going to shut down. You guys come if you want, but we're going to be up here preaching and teaching. I'm not... This is nonsense, what's going on in this world. It's time to... Um, I said to somebody the other day, man, what a fearful world desperately needs is a fearless church. Yeah. We need to be fearless, man. We need, to, we need to be just like those Joshua. Take the land. Let's take it. Spiritually. Thank you, so we should finish. It's 9.07. Ezra, your questions are too long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for our time, for your word. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. And uh, we just glorify you, Lord God, for all that you're doing in our lives and in the life of this body. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. God bless you guys.